Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Factors to Consider During Adaptation of a Manual Cell Line Development Workflow to Automation. I am Michelle Ashton of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots and brought to you by Beckman Coulter. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.beckman.com. Now let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or Report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Rob Ballinger of Alexion Pharmaceuticals Incorporated. For the complete biography on our speaker, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Rob, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, my name is Rob Ballinger, and I'm a Development Associate 4 at Alexion Pharmaceuticals in the Upstream Development Group. This group includes cell line development. We recently converted our manual cell line development process to an automated workflow. I'll present some factors to consider during adaptation of a manual cell line development workflow to, an au to automation based on what we've learned in that experience. Let me just mention this disclaimer. The views contained in this presentation do not reflect neither an endorsement from Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Inc., nor a partnership or collaboration between Alexion Pharmaceuticals, Inc. and Beckman Coulter. Let's start with a description of the basic cell line development workflow. It starts with a number of transient transfections for molecule evaluations. This step could be an iterative process as additional or modified molecules may be repeatedly evaluated. A selected lead molecule or molecules are transfected into host cells with a plasmid containing the gene of interest and a selection marker to generate a stable cell line. Transfected cells are then placed under selective pressure to select for clones containing the gene of interest. Cells can then be plated to isolate single cell clones. These clones are then expanded through various vessels of increasing growth area or volume and finally evaluated to choose the best clones for master cell banking and manufacturing scale production. And although depicted as such, this is not an entirely linear process, with clone numbers expanding and contracting at various points and potential offsuits of productivity, product quality, or clone quality evaluation. Going forward, I will be focusing on the outgrowth and expansion portion of the workflow. That cell line development workflow lies within the critical path of drug development. Further product development cannot continue prior to a cell line being developed and a lead clone selected. How can we shorten that timeline? An automated process with increased throughput can provide the ability to prosecute more cell line development projects, potentially enabling the initiation of cell line development prior to final molecule selection. This allows molecule triage to occur concurrently with cell line development, so by the time a final molecule is selected, cell lines have already been developed. One of the challenges we are trying to address within the scope of increasing throughput is to increase the number of clones produced. This is a bottleneck in our workflow. We want to increase the number of clones produced and be able to handle that increased number. However, higher throughput with its associated increased evaluation equals more resources required. Therefore, we need to decrease resources. As for decreasing time, we are limited by the speed of cell growth. However, we could evaluate clones sooner to generate a selected subset of clones sooner. And that clone evaluation could involve, for example, not just titer, but linking it with cell number to get specific productivity or other factors that provide more predictive power of clone performance at scale. What we really want to do is find better clones faster. One way to address the challenge of decreasing resources while handling increased throughput of greater numbers of clones is automation. Process steps like incubation, plate imaging, and clone evaluation can be integrated to the liquid handling steps of scale-up, providing the ability to process more clones with less resources. 
The automation system could include a liquid handler at its core integrated with various devices. These devices could include ambient storage hotels for storage of consumables to be accessed during the process, incubators for culture plates, imaging devices for monoclonality or growth monitoring, and other analytics devices for clone assessments. All or part of the system can be enclosed in a laminar flow enclosure to maintain st sterility. Let's look at how a manual workflow evolves into the workflow on an automated liquid handling platform. This workflow starts with 96 well plates, scale up proceeds through various multi well plates, perhaps 48 well and 24 well as seen here. Clones are then transferred to T25 flasks and ultimately they are banked. The use of liquid handling robotics allows easy integration of 384 well plates at the beginning of the workflow. This instantly increases density of clones fourfold, allowing more clones to be produced in the same area or retaining the same level of clone production in a smaller area. This can provide space for more cell line development projects, permitting development of cell lines for multiple candidate molecules in the same footprint as one candidate molecule, and allowing cell line development to begin sooner. But the T25 flask is not easily adapted to automation. But let's first look at the addition of the 384 well plate to the workflow. As a new culture condition, the optimal plate construction had to be chosen. Cell growth had to be sufficient, and the plate has to fit well into other aspects of workflow, such as imaging. Once a plate is chosen, the optimal growth time in the 384 well plates had to be determined. Now that this 96 well plate fits into the workflow at a different point, now the second plate in the workflow rather than the first, the culture time in the 96 well plates also has to be determined. In the manual workflow, cultures started in the 96 well plate from a single cell. Refer to the red line on the chart starting at 0% confluence. Now in the automated workflow, the 96 well plates will be seeded with cultures from the 384 well plate. Those 384 well plates started with a single cell but have grown for a period of time. The 96 well plates in the automated workflow now start with a higher confluence than the 96 well plates in the manual workflow. Refer to the blue line on the chart starting at a higher confluence. Experiments to determine how this shifts the curve have to be performed to determine the proper growth time in the 96 well plate in the automated workflow. As we incorporate new plate types and translate our workflow to automation, we have the issue of converting the manual transfer of a semi-adherent colony to an automated liquid handler method. Manually transferring a semi-adherent colony is a simple task of pipetting up and down while moving the pipette tip across the bottom of the well, then tipping the plate to aspirate the entire volume. A basic liquid handling technique, seen here in the top panel, of briefly mixing in the center of the well only transfers limited cells. Solutions include multiple mixes for small wells, such as those in the 384 well plate. This also has to be tested as excessive aspiration or dispense speed could affect cell health, as could excessive numbers of mixes. For larger wells, a moving dispense depicted in the bottom panel could be utilized, emulating what is performed by a person. This method and other liquid handling operations were developed with extensive support from an expert at Beckman Coulter. Mixes are performed at edge locations with dispenses occurring as the tip moves across the well, dislodging cells as it goes. So, mixing at location 1, then aspirating at location 1, then dispensing while moving across the well from location 1 to location 2, and so on. Again, there is much optimization of this process. How much volume should be mixed? How fast can we mix without losing viability but still dislodging sufficient cells? What pattern should we use with a moving dispense to dislodge the most cells? Can all of this be accomplished in a reasonable amount of time as we would like to maximize throughput and minimize the time the culture is out of the incubator? Another lesson learned during the process was that we did not need to tilt the plate as we do in our manual workflow to aspirate sufficient volume from the well. Performing the final aspiration close to the edge and bottom of the well was sufficient. Back to our workflow. 
Now we've added the 384 well plate and adapted the 96 well step. The 48 well and 24 well scale up vessels can remain unchanged except for adaptation of liquid handling techniques as just explained. But as I mentioned earlier, the T25 flask is not easily adapted to automation. Let's look at four options to replace T flasks. Single well plates, a trade name is Omnitray. Six well plates, using multiple wells of multi well plates, 24 well plates are shown here, and deep well plates, used either shaken or stationary. Let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of each. One well plates have greater culture area than a T25, but can be difficult to handle on a robotic platform with potential sloshing of medium during plate movements. Six well plates are easy to handle robotically, but possess less culture area than a T25. Multiple wells of any plate size increase culture area, but sample tracking could get complicated. Deep well plates can be handled robotically, but perform best shaking, so a shaking in incubator would need to be integrated or the step would have to be taken offline, bringing back a limitation of the T flask. Looking at how many vessels would be required for a set of, say, 24 clones, single well plates are one for one, occupying 24 positions in automation, both on the deck and in an incubator. Six well plates gain a sum space, occupying only four spots. Multiple wells, in this example two, of a 24 well plate gets us down to two spots for 24 clones. A deep well 24 well gets us to one plate per 24 clones, but would have to be taken offline. For our workflow, the six well was the best compromise of culture area and space required while giving good culture growth and viability. But as a new culture vessel, six well plate culture conditions needed to be optimized. Using cell numbers estimated to be similar to those from cultures coming from the 24 well plate, the previous culture step, cultures of a range of volumes were initiated. Cell viability was measured through an anticipated culture duration. A culture volume was then selected to move forward. In the chart, in all three starting cell densities, culture volume A, the lightest blue line, returned the best cell viability and a culture duration of less than four days was required to maintain viability. Selection of culture volume should also be informed by pipetting method. For example, a starting volume of 1900 microliters would require three pipetting trips per well if your pipette tip can only hold 900 microliters. Keeping air gaps both leading and trailing in mind, a 1,025 microliter pipette tip holds less volume than 1,025 microliters in practice. An 1,800 microliter starting volume requires one fewer trip per well and could save many minutes per scale-up process. Again, we have to optimize pipetting te techniques for the six well plate. Optimizing pipetting techniques for the six well plate not only means pipetting methods of culture transfer like we've already discussed, but of filling the plate with fresh medium. It is best to pre-fill the destination plate with fresh medium prior to addition of the culture that is being scaled up. This allows the option of tips to be used repeatedly to fill multiple wells without chance of cross-contamination. However, repeated tip usage can result in medium remaining in the tips and with large aspiration volumes, that remaining medium can lead to drips or it could reach the filter, causing improper aspiration or dispensing. To reduce the amount of medium left in the tips, a slow dispense rate can be used to allow the maximum amount of medium to sheet down the tip during the dispense so little remains in the tip. This results in a time-consuming plate fill method. A potential solution is the use of wide bore tips. The wider bore and difference in tip shape allows a faster dispense with minimal medium remaining in the tip, reducing the possibility of drips and medium contacting the filter. Adding a delay before blowout reduces liquid retention even further. This could allow reusing tips across multiple wells with tips being changed less frequently during the method. Tip usage is another factor to consider as sufficient deck space needs to be allowed for the tips used and the time taken to change tips extends method time.
Now that we have our automated workflow planned, it has to be tested with an actual representative cell line development campaign. Type matting methods can then be optimized with truly representative cultures exhibiting representative cell number, positioning, and adherence. This also allows the actual culture time required in each new plate type to be evaluated. At each scale-up step, the decision to scale up can also be automated. When it comes time to scale up in a manual workflow, a confluency criterion can be subjective. With an automated workflow, the confluency criterion can be specifically defined. But confluency, for example, is variable. If 50% is chosen in this example, the colony on the left is not chosen, but the colony on the right is scaled up. A higher confluency criterion leads to missing some clones with slower growth, but perhaps high specific productivity, perhaps the colony on the left, but selected clones should have better growth. Selection of clones with lower confluency equals more clones, but they will contain slower growers. Workflows will be defined on best case or typical scenarios, but we continue to evaluate. Perhaps scaling up at 20% confluence causes lagging at the next culture step due to excessive split ratio, but waiting for 80% confluence results in loss of viability. Besides confluence, there are other assessments of clones. Assessment of clones in a manual process may be performed at a convenient point, with convenience defined by ease and sampling. For example, assessing clones at the 96 well step due to the ability to use a multi pipette for sampling. A liquid handling platform can make sampling at the 96 well step even easier by using a 96 well pipetting head. However, perhaps there is reduced predictive power of measurements at that stage. Perhaps sampling at a later stage is in fact more predictive of the parameter being assessed. Recall my earlier statement in the objective finding better clones faster liquid handling platform would not find this as inconvenient as a human sampler. I've described how a manual cell line development workflow can change when automation is implemented. Now let's look at how the job itself of cell line development might change. The first step is of course learning the operation of the liquid handling platform. From there is the process I've described of adapting your process to automation. I've mentioned a few lessons learned in the process, such as not needing to tip a plate during certain aspiration steps. It also caused us to look more closely at each step, particularly in regards to scale-up timing, as this can be scheduled with process management software. Through all this, your daily activities have evolved from pipetting to programming. Let's look a little closer at each of these points. The first step is learning to operate the liquid handling platform. That begins with the Biomex software that controls all the functions of the liquid handler. If that liquid handler is integrated into other equipment, such as incubators, plate hotels, plate imagers, plate readers, or other hardware, another layer of software, SAMI, is recommended for easier method scheduling. If multiple cell line development campaigns will be run with overlapping timelines, they can be scheduled and tracked with SAMI process management. Each of these comes with its own learning curve and time required to fully master. Beckman Coulter has provided extensive training and support through this learning process. As previously described, your workflow needs to be adapted to the automated platform. During that process, there were lessons learned. Culture volumes and durations for optimal growth in each plate type were determined. Pipetting methods were written and optimized for speed and techniques such as air gaps and tip touching added where necessary. Plate placement on deck was modified to minimize contamination possibilities. Plate locations on the liquid handler deck were selected where the pipetting head would cross over the least amount of culture area during handling. You can notice through this process of manual to automation, the job itself of a cell line developer is changing. The concern of one's job being replaced by a robot is not necessarily appropriate. Your daily activity changes from pipetting cultures to teaching a robot how to pipette cultures and supplying that robot with necessary inputs. The ergonomic concerns of repetitive pipetting are replaced with the concerns of working at a computer. The concept of doing each step better remains. And if a robot is performing much of the basic workflow tasks, there can be more time available for researchers to perform those experiments they've been wanting to do, if only they had the time. 
while the robot scales up the clones, you can plate some cells in that new medium you've wanted to try. Another change in daily activities is in methods of data management. Tracking of clones in a manual workflow might involve spreadsheets of clone IDs and locations on plates with descriptions of which clones were scaled up on what day. This process can be automated, with the database tracking the path of each clone through the workflow. Data from external analysis can be uploaded and appended to each clone's history. A lesson learned here is to confirm remaining database space prior to beginning a campaign. The database requires sufficient free space to fully record operations and to operate efficiently. Depending on your workflow, database size used at each step in the campaign can vary. The database must be properly configured to contain the data generated. Periodic archives are a good way to maintain available space. Besides the lessons learned mentioned previously, there are broader lessons as well. Implementing an automated workflow requires not only the obvious capital investment, but also a significant time investment. Even without workflow changes, translation of the manual workflow to automation requires significant programming time with repeated testing of methods. As discussed, changing or adding vessels requires testing and optimizing with your cell lines and the automation system. Optimizing just the aspiration of a single culture step could take days of testing. Bringing us to the next point, test, test, test. This point was partially addressed in regards to process adaptation, but it is worth mentioning again. Initial tests are run with empty plates to confirm labware movements. Later tests are run with medium. Here we confirm pipetting techniques aspirate at the proper speed to allow rapid aspiration while still allowing the liquid to fill the tip. Dispense speeds are also tested to determine the speed that allows proper emptying of the tip and doesn't result in dripping due to continued sheeting of the liquid down the tip after the dispense is completed. These effects will not be seen with water. Cell culture medium has a sufficiently different viscosity and surface tension that it will perform differently. Then you may run tests with culture with a representative cell density. Later you may realize that the medium pipettes differently after a number of days of incubation than it did in the test plates. After testing with single or small numbers of plates, your method may not behave as you would like after representative numbers of plates are included with robotic actions performed in the interest of efficiency, but not in the interest of your cells. Running one or several test campaigns could be helpful, as even after multiple campaigns have been run, you may still be optimizing, finally seeing things that don't occur until real-world conditions are met. Transitioning to the automated workflow too soon could result in timeline delays if the automated workflow fails. Your first run of an actual cell line development campaign requires either full trust in the system, sufficient backup plates, or a simultaneous manual workflow. All of these require additional resources. Trust in the system is developed with sufficient testing. Backup plates require greater equipment use. A simultaneous manual workflow requires human resources, who therefore may not be available for the automated workflow. During the implementation and testing, getting all potential users to the same level of expertise is helpful. While one super user may be the primary operator, if there are multiple people in the group using the system, an adequate level of ability and comfort is important. So let's look at the results of all this and how it meets the objectives listed at the beginning. The first objective was increasing the number of quality clones produced. 384 well plates increase clones per plate. Automation can handle more plates. These are two steps towards more clones. Once the automation is self-sufficient, there will be time for process improvements, such as testing new cloning medium that could lead to a gain in clone outgrowth. The second objective was decreasing resources. Automation can allow more clones to be processed than in a manual workflow without a proportional increase in full-time employee time. These gains come again from the ability to use 3D4 well plates, which increases the number of clones per plate over 96 well plates, the ability to process more plates, and the ability to perform other tasks while the automation system is performing the scale up, imaging, sampling, and other clone processing tasks. 
With the ability to handle more clones and more plates, an automated process can provide the ability to prosecute more cell line development projects, as introduced earlier, potentially allowing initiation of cell line development prior to final molecule selection. This allows molecule triage to occur concurrently, so by the time a final molecule is selected, cell lines have already been developed. With more clones that are easier to handle, we have moved the start of cell line development back off the critical path, producing manufacturing-ready cell lines sooner. So, in conclusion, automation has increased throughput without an increase in resources after methods are adapted and optimized. Increased throughput allows more clones to be produced or more candidate molecules to be pursued, potentially allowing cell line development to begin earlier in CMC development. Automated workflows require adaptation of manual workflows, occasionally with significant time input. Automated workflows may be counterintuitive to manual workflows, such as filling a plate on demand just as it enters a workflow where a person would rather pre-fill all plates prior to beginning scale-up. Increased throughput increases our chances of finding better clones. Since we can produce and process more clones and potentially use improved or additional evaluation techniques to better evaluate more clones, we have increased our chances of finding a better clone. Looking through more hay gives us a better chance of finding the needle. To close, I would like to acknowledge those people here at Alexion and at Beck and Coulter that made this webinar possible. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rob, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, you mentioned test, test, test. How long was the process optimization, and how did you maintain productivity during this time? Yes, we spent about six months after installation on method writing, development, and testing. During this time, selling development projects were completed manually. Uh, we would have actually preferred a little more time, but we needed to initially a cell line development project on the automation at that time. So that project became what amounted to our first real shakedown run. Uh, we did have sufficient confidence in the system uh, at the time, so it wasn't a massive leap of faith, and we ran sufficient number of plates to account for any method failures we might have. What is the comfort level of your group members when it comes to using Biomech and SAMI software? How was their learning curve? Most of our group is now quite comfortable with the software, uh, with three power users, I'll call them. Two of the power users uh, had used other automation systems in the past, so they took to the software very quickly, uh, becoming very skilled in just a couple of months. Um, we all continue to learn to this day, but we, we are very comfortable with it now. Great, thank you. What are the top three factors you considered when selecting Beckman as your automation vendor? Hmm. I would say their previous experience with integrated systems, uh, the customer support, and the capability of the system. Uh, I'll address each of those. Beckman showed that the Biomech and SAMI software can be integrated with just about anything, and they had integrated equipment like ours in the past, including sterile enclosures. Um, they provided the best support uh, through the vendor selection process and continue to do so, and the Biomech itself had the liquid handling capabilities that met or exceeded other options. Great, thank you. Looks like we have time for one more question. Why did you decide to automate only a part of your cell line development workflow? Hmm. Earlier stages in the workflow, such as transfection, were low throughput and easily performed manually, so we didn't need to optimize those on automation. Later stages, such as those after the six well stage, can be automated, but it would require greater time and capital investment than we were interested uh, at the time. We were and continue to be comfortable with executing those stages manually. Thank you again, Rob, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank Labyrinth and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. 
Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.